Welcome to Profit Led, the podcast for bootstrap entrepreneurs looking to make it happen. My name is Melissa Kwan. I'm the co founder and CEO of eWebinar and your host. With me is my co host, Todd Parmley, eWebinar's COO. Hey, Todd, how's it going? I'm good. I'm great. I'm glad we're on, uh, what is it, episode four now? Yeah, <laughs> so four. We're so grown up. We are. We're very grown up. <laughs> In the last episode, we talked about why I chose to bootstrap eWebinar and what it means to bootstrap a startup, how we made it work by keeping burn as low as possible, the different funding options available for bootstrappers and common misconceptions. Uh, we also talked about how being a bootstrap company shapes eWebinar, our culture, and how we make every decision, which I think is important for our listeners to understand because being a bootstrapped lifestyle company is the ethos of our company. and really sets up the premise for the rest of the season. It's what makes us who we are and why we are the way we are. And this season of Profit Led is all about our journey to a million at eWebinar, bootstrapping the company from day one. Our goal is to give a window into what it's like to build a company with very little resources. Each episode goes in depth into one major aspect of our journey. We share war stories, mistakes, lessons learned as we grew the company to a million in annual recurring revenue over 36 months. Today on episode four, we're going to talk about putting together a founding team with limited resources or really like very, very limited resources. <laughs> so Todd, we've come, we've come such a long way since it was just the two of us. Yeah. From our, what is it? Pasta in the village where we had lunch and talked about eWebinar for the first time. It's been yeah. a lot And I remember the next week I saw you to conceptualize this more, you're like, oh yeah, I'm on a different diet now. And you had like a bag of almonds. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> like, you're like, I'm only eating this now. I'm like, what? You just had like, yeah. you just had like carbonara, like raviolis <laughs> like last yeah. week. Right. What and then happened? I'm eating almonds. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, I don't like this version of you. <laughs> um, I mean, so where do you, where do you want to get started with, with today's conversation? Well, I mean, so like what we, last time we talked about the decision to bootstrap, right. And you, had, and yeah. the episode before that was, you know, what, how did you come up with the idea of eWebinar? So you have an idea, yeah. you decide to bootstrap and then what? So it's time to like, you know, put together a team. So how did yeah. you think about putting together a founding team? So I started eWebinar, like incorporated it two months after I sold my previous startup. Hmm. And not many people know this. So I had the same co-founder for 10 years and now I have a different one who's, who's David, who's also my life partner. But I really had like PTSD from... Hmm that co-founder. And it's not like he was a bad guy. Like we were best friends. He was super trustworthy. Like we were like, like we really were like each other's strongest relationship for those 10 years. Right. Like that's what I felt like. Yeah. But I like, even though he was a great engineer, he was not a good CTO. And that was actually the one thing we never found a resolution for. We never mm. overcame that. But that was where every single debate, argument, conflict came from was he was not a great partner, like mm. co-founder in that sense. He was just an amazing engineer, but he never led a team before. But it's right. not his fault because right, right. I, we started working together as soon as he graduated from university. Right. So he never worked in like a corporate environment where he learned like teamwork or really even learned like – CTO processes. We didn't have processes. We didn't have a Jira. We didn't have like a Monday or like Trello. We had nothing. Oh Everything God. was in his head. Oh and so like you would die. Like you would not survive. Oh my God. Yeah. Like a process oriented person <laughs> would not survive. Yeah. And near the end of that company, I realized that I had built the business, but on his timeline because nothing mm. was ever on time. And I wasn't a tech person and I couldn't critique what he was doing. And I, I really trusted him hundred percent, but he wasn't ever giving me the thing that he said he would give me. Hmm. And I don't actually think that is an uncommon thing. If it, if you're a business founder that don't know how to code, like right. you're just right. like, if you had an incredible CTO who really understands where you need to be and that you've made promises to customers based on what they say, like, you're very lucky, but I think a lot of developers, like actually my old CEO who bought my company once said like the better developer you are, the more optimistic you are. 
And so yeah, the right. least likely you are to give a realistic <laughs> timeline of anything. And so right. I spent 10 years working under those conditions. Yeah. And I was just tired of like having a co-founder that didn't understand where I was, that I didn't feel like was a true partner. Um, and that I couldn't figure out how to manage, right. For lack of a better term. Right. So I kind of, I was frustrated with all that. And I thought I could start this company without a co-founder. So you weren't um, looking for a co-founder. You weren't looking for a CTO. You were going to do it. No, you were going to do it. Yeah. Right. Okay. No. So, um, so basically I thought I could start this company without a CTO. And, and, and the thing is I had su such little knowledge into what coding means, right? even after 10 years of, of like yep. running a startup that I thought I could have a tech company without a tech co-founder that I could just hire a dev shop that would do everything product and they take care of it. And then I could do everything I'm good at, which is right. building the business. Right. And so that kind of sounded like heaven for me. And, um, I had a friend that, you know, owned a dev shop that I trusted and I thought this shop, I would pay them because now I had some money that I exited. Yeah. Um, I would pay them to make the first version and they would be my co-founder. So that was kind of like step one of my original thought. And of course it didn't end up that way, but it did start that way. So that was kind of like, like that was the next step, I guess, after right. I called you and we had talked about that a little bit in the, in the second episode is like, I knew I needed someone to help me with content and conceptualizing and market research and language on the website, which was you. Right. And then I needed someone to help me build the thing that we were going to come up with. Okay. So then that was the, the quote unquote founding team at first, it was me, you and the dev shop in, yeah. uh, where were they in, uh, they were in Canada, Canada. Right. Yeah. And, and just to, I think it's probably helpful to point out that, uh, you know, in this case, a dev shop also included, um, designers, like they did brand, not only brand, not only did they help us, uh, with product design and developing the, uh, the product, but also they did, uh, brand identity and they helped us put together our first version of our website, right. For marketing purposes. Yeah. So when I talk about like a dev shop, they were a full service dev shop. So right, right, they right. actually had and still have, um, an incredible kind of UI UX designer, um, yes. that was, oh, amazing. you know, also responsible for like, I forgot if it was Twitter. No, it was Dropbox and medium. He was also responsible for like, I don't know how big, but he definitely took part in it, but he was yeah. not just branding, um, and like really understand, understood the concept, but also like, like UI UX and, um, actually it turned out that we were like the biggest project that he had ever designed. <laughs> it's very rare that I think a designer gets to go from like just right. incorporation to like the first version. But yeah, like yeah. it was, a, if it was basically a company that I thought could, I could offload everything except the business to. Right. Right. Um, and unfortunately it turned out to be like a fairly expensive mistake, but it did leave, lead me to David, uh, who right. is, you know, my current co-founder. Well, what if, what if David wasn't an option? What if there was no David, what would you have done? I mean, where would you, where would you find, you know, once you realized, okay, I need a CTO, yeah. then what, what do you do? Yeah. I mean, I think I, I think I would have called up my ex co-founder again. Like we were, I mean, he was still contracting for the co company that bought, like that bought our company. Um, yeah. I might have done it, but, um, maybe reluctantly, I think. So after we sold that company, I did talk to him about different projects and, yeah, you know, big and small, but nothing really materialized. And, um, I, I really felt like while it made sense that we continue to do new things together, it also felt like both of us felt like in our souls that we were ready to move on from each other. Yeah, you know, yeah. like, it's like, it's like when you've like sense. kind of come to the end of that friendship because you've grown, it's, it was 10 years, like we were yeah. different people. Yeah. So I felt like it was a bit forced and honestly, like to find someone that feels passionate about the same idea that you feel passionate about is quite difficult. Uh, but if I didn't have David, I would 
would have maybe called him up and and I would have sold him on the idea of I really needed someone. Yeah. But the second thing I would have done is I would have reached out to my immediate circle of friends um, who were probably senior in their engineering roles, who were probably pretty stable yeah. in like their financial position. So maybe they're a CTO for another company and they're kind of ready to, to come out on their own and we didn't need to pay them a market rate for the next two, three years. I would find that person, like someone who's not fully money driven, like, because they have enough of it right now. And um, maybe someone with like a young family or whatnot that wants to, right. to stay at home and wanted less structure. Like I would look for, I would definitely look for, look for that guy, but it would absolutely have to be someone that doesn't have a full-time job. Like I would have needed right. to find someone that was in this with me full-time because I was doing it full-time. Right. Yeah, I mean, D David, we have done well with David. I think that's an understatement. <laughs> think that's he an was right in my house, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> you didn't have to look far. But but let's say you didn't, right? Going back to this idea, you didn't. How do you vet somebody? Like as a not, because I'm also, I wor I've, I've yeah. worked in product for 20 years, and I yeah. conceptually understand code. I, have, I can really collaborate with engineers. But if I'm asked to, like, assess someone's ability as a, you know, a system for system design for, you know, for yeah. coding, like, how do you do that? I mean, everyone thinks they're a great coder. This is the problem, <laughs> right? But it's like a Rubik's cube, right? It's just like, it's just like gamble, you know, like coding is, is hard. And there's so many, there's like a hundred paths to get to the same place. Um, I mean, just to give some context, right? Like I, I did work with a dev shop for a year. You were there for most of that. I mean, all of that, actually, you were there for day one. Um, yeah. Right. And things weren't working. And we right. got to a place where, you know, because with dev shops, like you pay by milestones. So let's say there were like four milestones and, um, it got to a place where they couldn't reach the next milestone, but they were trying to reach it so they could get paid. Yeah. But right. not all software is built the same. So things weren't working. Right. They were throwing more people on it, more time. We weren't getting the product that we needed. They wanted to get paid. So nobody was winning. Right, right. At, at that time. And David was a, a, a fractional CTO for other companies. Um, and he was helping kind of advise on the technology because we were always going to go from the Canada dev shop to a Vietnam dev shop to save on costs after the first version was built. I just wanted the first version to build by like somebody in North America so that the quality would be higher in theory. Um, but as David was critiquing things, he's like, oh, this is wrong. This is wrong. And this is why it's not working. I'm like, you know what? Like no one's winning. Right. You're not coding, but you're saying things are wrong, but you're not fixing it. These guys are trying to do more stuff, but they're just burning resources and time yeah. for us. Yeah. And then I feel bad because it's a, it's a friend's dev shop and now I'm not able to pay them. So everything was right. kind of imploding. And I was like, you know what? We need to end this in this relationship, like with right. the dev shop. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, why don't you start helping? And so within like a week of David starting to actually code like things were working like they started working for the first time and while i don't know how to tell a good coder from a bad coder i do know that good software works and bad software doesn't work yeah right. and it is really as simple as that yeah that's right and so when things really start to work i'm like okay we need to accelerate this kind of ending of this relationship so unfortunately it was at a, a friend's dev shop our friendship's not really the same anymore i think there was it was not it was not like their fault or our fault. I think we both hugely underestimated the size of the project. Yeah. And as, as people do, it's like renovating a house, right? It's like, right. it's going to cost yeah. 50,000. It's like, no, it's 500. Um, so <laughs> it didn't end on great terms. We did kind of recover from that, from that a little bit, but not, it's not the same. Uh, but it was better for the both of us. And David started helping full time. And then I made it like, I basically just went to him and said, Hey, I don't have a tech co-founder. I now realize that a founding team of a startup needs a tech co-founder. <laughs> Otherwise, um, it's not a real startup. What I ended up doing was, um, I just asked David like, Hey, like I need a co-founder. You seem to be making things work. <laughs> what is the equity that you need? to feel invested in this project, um, like you're an owner, but you're also coming in a year later. So what is that, what is that number that you need to do this together? Right. And that right. was actually how 
you know, that relationship started. Um, and I think like how you vet someone, whether someone is technical or not, is how I would vet anybody is you just give them a project, right? Yeah. So right. in my previous two startups, um, I also worked with my co-founder as a contractor before we became like co-founders. Right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you just see if they can do what they say and you just see if when they code, the software works. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I remember when David came in to kind of assess the situation, even the way he was talking about the problems that he was yeah. finding showed a level of expertise that I recognized as having work, worked with talented engineers. So I can say that immediately from the beginning, I felt a sense of like a much deeper sense of confidence, right? And relief. And then, yeah, yeah, and relief. Yeah. Oh, my God. And then, and then you know, there was a lot of work to fix some sort of like, um, you know, to fix what was under the hood. The front end looked okay, right? But to fix what well, was he, behind. He rebuilt a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And it and so it, it we, 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 um, it took time to fix that, right? And that's the ex quote unquote expensive mistake. Um, but then things stopped breaking. Like yeah. we rarely had outages. Yeah. The only time or, or issues that came up. And the only time we did was when something was really something we couldn't have like a blind spot. Yeah. Like Amazon's like was down or like sometimes Vimeo right. goes down, which is kind of our backbone. Um, but there were things that like, there were decisions made that were just really weird. Right. So, right. um, you know, to give context to people listening, like the first step of creating an e-webinar is you upload a video and we use Vimeo as our video provider. The first version of the video uploader worked as follows. It would upload <laughs> first to something that like some cloud that we had, and then it would then upload to YouTube and then it would, Vimeo would download from YouTube. <laughs> like it just, it didn't make any sense. Yeah, it was bonkers. And the thing is that? like, the problem was like, every time I went back to my friend's dev shop and was like, Hey, David said this, they'd be like, Oh, don't worry. We'll fix it. And this was the crux of the problem is like, I trusted them because I had to, and I didn't have someone on my side to ask the important questions. And when they say, yeah. when it's my friend, especially, and they say they're going to fix it, of course, I'm, I'm not going to question them, but it never gets fixed and it doesn't yeah. work. And then now and I don't have a product to sell. Yeah. And it's an inherent tension with the dev shop, right? Because they, you know, want it they want to just make things work. And, you know, it's not like, even if they have great intentions, it's not like they were consciously hiding anything, but we, like you said, we were not really able to see behind the curtain, right? Cause if we had had somebody on our side, they would have at least at the very least been able to tell us, um, you know, what they saw that was, didn't seem like it was going in a good direction, you know? Um, yeah. And I mean, now, like when people ask me for advice on like working with dev shops, I'm like, I only work with dev shops. However, please don't do it unless you have someone full-time on your side yes, that's right. aligned with your values and what you care about and your business. Cause otherwise, like, in fact, like, I, I feel like a lot of times when you're working with dev shops, like the, the motivation is kind of misaligned, right? Like yep. they want to get paid as quickly yes. as possible and they want to hit this milestone. So it doesn't matter how quickly they get to that milestone. Like they just That's want to get right. to it. So the quality of what they're building, cause they're not building for scale. They're not a long-term team. Right. So, right. you know, so they like, once they hit this and they show you and I'm not a technical person and then I'm just going to pay you. Right. So yeah. I think a lot of bad experiences just come from not having a technical lead. But I also think that a lot of agencies in general, not yeah. just development, but marketing also, um, is it's like, it's much easier to build a feature of something that exists, right? right? To add on to something that's successful, right? So to take something from like one to two, but zero to one it's has really so hard. much oh my God. experimentation yeah, and iteration. Really like, in fact, the first time we launched a product, I remember like the first time we had a thousand people trying to join a webinar <laughs> and the system was crashing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember that. like David jumped on it and he fixed it immediately. He knew what the problem was, but like, I remember like just this feeling of relief because I knew that if I was working with a dev shop, they wouldn't be on my time. 
No. And but this person's having this webinar now, and they wouldn't be able to figure out that problem as quickly as a person that's on my side. So that's right. when I really understood, like, okay, this is why restaurants have chefs <laughs> and startups right. have technical co-founders. Yeah, right. Yeah, it may seem like. It, it, in hindsight, it's so obvious, but I get how at yeah. the time it really seemed like a perfect, a perfectly reasonable path to take. Um, so let, maybe let's. But nothing's obvious little... until you live through it. No, no. it was also if... obvious that I wouldn't like split my company with someone I didn't really know very well. So why would I go to a co-founder that I haven't never worked with, or yeah. why would I go to a co-founder if this dev shop told me they can do everything I want to do? Who am I yeah. to say you're not going to give me that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's just funny. Once it becomes clear, it's clear. But when it's not, <laughs> yeah. like, what is it? Denial is not a river in Egypt? Or maybe that doesn't quite apply here. But, um, so let's let's switch gears a little bit. Um, so you started eWebinar with the premise that you were only going to work with contractors, right? Yeah. Why did you make that decision? I mean, truthfully... I just really do not like managing people. I'm bad at it. And even in my last company, like my old co-founder, like he's the opposite of me, right? He loves going to the office, the nine to five, having a team, like to kind yeah. of banter all day and like love structure. I am complete opposite. <laughs> like I socialize with my friends, not my company. And I was nomading and that team was in Vancouver. And so, and I've always hated the confrontational conversations you have to have when someone doesn't work out because right. I'm the person to have that conversation. And so I just like, I, I just always dreamt of a company where I could work with people that I didn't have to manage, mm -hmm. number one, but also people that were self-motivated so yeah, much right. that I didn't have to manage them. Right. And that they would be here because they want to, not because they have job security. Right, right. 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 So um, I just knew that the next company I wanted fully remote team and only work with contractors. But also, um, I think it's become much easier to hire, you know, overseas or anywhere in the world for, for really passion and skill set and not locality. Right. That hiring contractors is the only way a bootstrap company like ours can, can survive, can, right. can be in yeah. existence, right? Like how much would it cost to hire even engineers in Canada, for, like not even to mention the US, like I wouldn't be able to afford that person. Yeah, right. right? Like a, you know, a junior person would start at 75,000, you know, whatever, whatever that is, right? And then it goes up to, you know, sky's the limit. But um, I think there's a beauty in being able to hire someone anywhere in the world, who yeah. loves your project, who wants to be yeah. a part of it. Yeah. And you can pay them market rate because I want to pay people market rate. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to work for less. Right? I don't want to give them that life. I feel bad carrying that. So yeah. the idea that I could hire anyone anywhere in the world, pay them market rate or more yeah. by you know giving a bonus or, or whatnot, like at the end of the year, um, is like compelling to me. Like I'd rather have someone on our team with value alignment. Yeah, then yeah, someone's like, sure. oh, I'm working here because, you know, you're in Vancouver or you're in New York. Yeah, for sure. And and going back to that idea of like, or that feeling, and I have, I share it, by the way, of not wanting to manage people, not feeling like you're good at managing people. But when people are independent and invested and passionate, then it's like, you're, you're you become collaborators, right? You're not having yeah. to manage them. You're, you're sharing direction maybe, right, as the C CEO, but it's not, it's just not the same. Um, and so you yeah. end up with partners, you end up with collaborators rather than people you're trying to manage. It's just a different mindset, I think, on both sides. And a lot of people that we contract, contract for someone else. Right. And they're right. usually like a bit more senior, right? Like you're, it's very hard to find a junior contractor, um, right. at least for, for what we do. Um, but, and they're fairly senior. They probably enjoy other freedoms in their life and therefore they're more motivated and they don't need the social aspect of being at work, you know, physically with people. Right. And at this point in my career, um, I find that more freeing, like to, yeah. to know that I can put this thing in the hands of someone. I don't have to check their work. Like it's just such a luxury. Yeah, right. And I actually think the contractor model is better for both sides. So for our side, of course, is the benefits that I mentioned, 
Um, but for the contractor side, like they're being hired for the highest dollar per hour for their expertise. Right. So if I'm really good at, you know, writing long form content, uh, that is S SEO optimized. That is the only thing I do. And the clients that hire me pay me, you know, $2,000 a, you know, a piece, but now right. I'm working with, you know, five clients. Whereas if I were to be hired as a full-time writer, you know, I would have to do a lot of other things. That's not just right. Long form SEO. Right. So right. now my time is actually, I'm not making the best and highest use of my time. So I actually think on the contractor side, if, if you can manage finding clients and, and be, you know, and, and know how to like promote yourself and, and be self-motivated, you can actually work the same hours, but actually get much higher dollar for, for your yeah. time because you, you are the expert for that thing. Yeah. And there's a sense of ownership too. And there's pride in your work. There's, there's just so many other things that come along, come along with it. Um, how did you find our contractors? Like how have, how have we found contractors? Always by referral. Right, so right, with, sure. with develop, like with development, because they're coders, we only work with dev shops. Like we have tried hiring a, you know, an independent developer, but I think what we realize, and, and this is something that David's told me, like, unless you're super senior and there are other things that motivate you, you want to learn from other people in the office. You want to bounce ideas. Yeah, you sure. want to be together and you learn by osmosis. Um, and we know we can't give a developer that. So right, we right. hire through dev shops and they have an office, right? So we hire through a Vietnam dev shop in Ho Chi Minh. And also now through a Norwegian dev shop that has an office in Ukraine. So they primarily hire in Ukraine, but give them like European benefits, which I actually think is, is super cool. Yeah, but cool. we, we picked Vietnam because we just love Vietnam. So we wanted more <laughs> reasons to go there. And I heard like the, like 50% of the population is pretty young because of the war and people are like hospitable and hardworking and all the big tech companies are, are starting in Vietnam for these reasons. So I was like, yeah, cool. Like, let's go there and check it out. So before I went there, uh, I just posted in this, uh, you know, Canadian founders Facebook group yeah. and asked if anyone knew dev shops in Vietnam. Hmm. And I got five names uh, and then like a recruiter or something. And actually we went in 2019 winter of, um, yeah, winter of 2019, we went to Vietnam and we met with all the dev shops. We met the founders, we met the, you know, potential team members. We wanted to see how good they were at speaking English versus writing English. Yeah. Right. Um, and just wanted to get a feel for like what the work culture was like. And then we picked the one that we thought, um, that we vibed with the most. Um, and that was the most willing to work with a company as small as ours. Yeah. And there still are our, our dev shop today. Um, and like, actually the Norwegian dev shop, I heard about through a friend when I was at a house party in Bangkok, hmm. like last year. So the thing is, if you're on LinkedIn every single day, you will get multiple advertisements on DM <laughs> telling you that my dev shop has the best developers in the world. If right. only that were true, I, I <laughs> wish that were true, but it is so far from the truth. Every, like, how does everyone have the best developers? It's just impossible. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. <laughs> so number one is definitely by referral. Um, but even like, you know, we've known each other for years before eWebinar, but even yeah. now with like any writer, any marketer, um, any designer, it's 100% through somebody that has worked with that person before or someone I know in my immediate network. Because mostly we, hi we don't have time to waste on someone that doesn't, work out. So we need some, we need some sort of reference that we trust. Um, but I also think there's like a lot of people would disagree on this, but I think there's beauty in working with people that you already know. Yeah. Oh, like I love, sure. I love working with friends. I think 50% yeah. of the time it doesn't work out, but I yeah. personally love working with friends and absolutely I've had bad experiences. However, um, you know, I think it's still cool to be able to build a company with friends. Yeah. And when it does work out, right, it's yeah. amazing. You know, so yeah. it's like. It doesn't stop me that it, you know, there are times where it actually did blow up. <laughs> but, yeah. Right. Yeah. Know. It's a risk. Right. But when it works out, it's amazing. Hey, I'd like to take a second here to talk about my own company, eWebinar, and our mission to rescue people from what I call webinar hell 
to give them back their time and save them literally hundreds of hours every month through webinar automation. If your sales team is tired of doing the same demo over and over for unqualified leads or worse, prospects who don't even show up, an on-demand demo powered by eWebinar can help them get their time back so they can close more deals. If you're doing customer onboarding and training on repeat, eWebinar can help you automate those so you never have to do them live again. Customer success teams are using eWebinar to run hundreds of sessions every single month without a live host. Why don't you give our product a try and see for yourself? Visit eWebinar.com to join our own on-demand demo or to sign up for a free trial. All right, now that I've gotten that on my system, let's get back to the episode. A lot of people are hesitant to work with contractors, right? Um, yeah. They think contract, like I mean, they think contractors are less committed. Um, yeah. How would you respond to someone who sort of had that point of view? I mean, I think the word contractors carries this connotation that like you have 10 other jobs. Right. Like that's what people think about, right? But a contractor to me is just someone who works with an international company. Because paying you as a contractor is the only way I can hire you. Right, right. Right? Like if you're in Canada, you might have to become an employee anyway because we're right. incorporated in Canada. And we, if we treat you like a full-time employee, like we could get challenged that you have to become an employee. Right, right. Um, so being a contractor is as much... Um, I guess, a, an accounting thing <laughs> yeah. as it is like just a, a role that someone chooses. But I think it's a misconception because I think people think contractors are less focused because they're working with multiple clients. But the way I see it is, like I said before, is you are doing the thing you're best at for me. And right. I love that. I love having a quarter of your time because I would rather you spend – the rest of your time, you know, doing something. I think everybody should spend time doing what they're best at, right? Like yeah. we're, we're, we try to do that within the company as well. Otherwise it's just, it takes too long and it's, it's exhausting. So I don't think also like, I think when people think about contractors, they think, oh, this person is part-time or they bounce in and out. That it doesn't mean that because you get to define that relationship, right? Like you get to define the scope of what they're working on, how much they work, how they work with you, whether or not they can take other projects. Um, so, I mean, with anybody on our team, they could take a side project if they want, but customer comes first, right? Yeah. But I think with the people on our team now, I think they're so invested in eWebinar that like, this is their thing, but yeah, right. I don't want to stop someone from doing what maybe helps them be more creative or something on the side that they feel like they need. Yeah, right? Like I wouldn't want someone to stop me. So we actually encourage those things. And I mean, both you and David had contracting jobs for one to two years, right? Yeah, right. Like as we were starting this company and it actually helped benefited us because we didn't have to pay you guys the, the rate that we otherwise, you know, would have. So um, I think it's a misconception that like contractors are less committed. They're not like employees. Um, you know, they, they, they don't take you as seriously, right? Because right. they're always on to the next thing. But Honestly, for us, like a team member is a team member. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so far, so far it's worked out. And I think it's, to your point, like it's really empowered people to take ownership and yeah. feel like they are contributing to this project because they're not slacking off. Yeah. Right. right? Like, and, and like in a small startup, if you're not contributing, we know immediately. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It encourages people to bring them their best selves to the, to the, to work. Right when they're working on working for you. Yeah. I mean, you started as a very part-time contractor. That's true. Like, That's did, right. like, did you feel less committed to eWebinar because of that? Because I actually felt like you felt what it felt like to me was you, you were more committed to eWebinar because of that. Cause it was like the fun thing that you were doing outside of like the normal job that was like paying you pretty well. Yeah. I mean, it was a, unusual time in my life, right? Just to be clear, like, you know, I was under a non-compete, so I couldn't work. I had been offered this like job uh, that I was going to take six months from now. Um, but yeah, I was working very part-time, um, but I loved it. Like, it, 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 I, I mean, I took ownership of it sort of immediately. Uh, um, and, you know, so so there was that period, right? And meanwhile, I was in that period looking forward to this job, which was going to start in six months. 
as fully assuming that I was going to take that as a full-time job, right? In fact, they, you know, that was the assumption. I was going to work as an employee for them. And uh, I don't know, maybe three months in, two months in, I don't know what it was. But I was like, I think I like this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went to that company and I said, hey, I, I'm working on this thing now. I really like it. Are you open to having me work for you four days a week as an independent contractor? And they said, yes, much to my surprise. And that was how it started. So it was the best of both worlds for me because I was able, I, I loved working for that company. Um, but um, I was much more passionate about eWebinar for a, a lot of different reasons. Um, I knew yeah. that if it did become a full-time thing, it would give me more freedom, right? It would allow me to permanently, I mean, COVID was happening, right? So everyone was working remotely, but like it would let me work permanently remotely, like give me flexibility with my schedule. But I also love working on small scrappy teams. Like that's where I kind of thrive the most, even if I'm a part of a small scrappy team within a larger company, because I like to have my fingers in a lot of pies. Like I like understanding different parts of the business. I am kind of admittedly a jack of all trades and, you know, master of none. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, but like, you know, I understand how to do a lot of different things uh, well enough, especially for a small growing company. And, um, so I wanted to get out of prop tech. That was also part of it. I'd been in prop tech for yeah. almost 20 years and I wanted to change. Um, and I also really wanted to work with someone I trusted and I liked. I mean, I had good, um, uh, first of all, I had these kind of terrible experiences with these two startups I was at. Um, but um, yeah, the idea of having a, a friend and collaborator as long as it worked, right? And that someone that I yeah. trusted and that trusted me, that was also a big part of my decision. So but, I think it was But I think a lot of, of senior things. people were in, were or are in that position, right? Where yeah. I'm at the point where I'm wondering, okay, is this corporate job going anywhere? Is there something that's more for me? I've always wanted to dabble on this thing, but I've never had the opportunity and now I have some freedom. Like you know, David was also was also that guy when he joined, you know, his previous startup. Um, yeah. But I think the key, like now that we're talking about founding teams, is like you need to find people who are kind of in that headspace, right? Who can really yeah. help you, who have the skills that you're not experimenting with people who are too junior and who have, you know, some kind of financial fallback that they're not like in dire straits if they don't get paid in the next few months, um, and sometimes, very rare, I think, for co-founders, but like the founding team, like sometimes they're in full-time jobs, Yeah. but they're willing to work on this evenings and weekends. Yeah, right. And like, those are the people that are like, that turn out to be gold because as soon as they see the vision, they're in it and they, they work harder because they want to get out of the corporate job. Yeah. Like they're trying their best right. to contribute to help you succeed so they can change their life. Yeah, for and sure. And I think and there's it, a lot of people out there that are like that. And they, they can't quit their job 100%, but this becomes like a bit of a bridge. And I, yeah, I really think that's true. I never really thought about that in terms of myself, but there's no there's no way they would have let me four day, work for them four days a week as a contractor if I wasn't a senior person, right? That, that yeah. couldn't like... You know, if I were a junior, they'd be like, are you kidding me? Like, no. Um, so I think that is kind of the sweet spot, like finding someone yeah. who has a lot of experience. They're looking for something new. They have either the side hustle or the financial stability to kind of take a little bit of a risk and try something new. Because that, that's definitely where, where I was. Um, but that's also a great way to, you talked about like vetting people, right? Like, yeah, right. it's not just skill sets. Yeah, it's right. like mission alignment, yeah, vision alignment, sure. value alignment. It's vibe alignment, right? Do we get along? Like you're the first few people that start helping your startup, like you're going to be like work best friends with these people. So yeah. do you get along? Right? Like, and yeah. like passion is not something that you can fake. No, 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 no. Right. You and it wasn't it, even with David, it wasn't until like, he was just helping me out as a contractor. Like right. to bridge, you know, kind of getting getting rid of this this dev shop. Yeah. But you can tell 
when someone is so passionate about this thing that they're working on it and thinking about it all the time. Yeah, right. Like every For waking sure. moment, they're trying to contribute. They're throwing out ideas. And it was only then that I was like, okay, I think it's time to maybe bring this up in a, in a more serious way. Um, but it works with anybody on that founding team. Right. So like just putting ourselves in the shoes of the person that, that's starting a company, right? A new founder, right? Who's looking to put together a founding team. What does a great founding team look like? Like if you like what, how would you describe that? You say, look for these things. What would you say? Yeah. I mean, I think at the very, very bare minimal, you need yeah. two expertise. It's right. very rare that they appear in the same person. Uh, but, you know, solo founders do exist. Uh, I obviously tried to be one of them and didn't work. Um, but two, like you need two expertise. So one is product, right? CTO, like someone's coding it. Yep. Um, and then the other is sales, like yeah, on the business right. side, right? Like right. so, but sales is also like visionary yep. sales, marketing, messaging. Yeah, you know, strategy. In the beginning, you're, you're yeah. like literally everything. So at the very, yeah. very bare minimal, you need yeah. two expertise. Most of the time, yeah, it's two people. Yeah, right. Right. So right. let's just say it's your CTO and, and your CEO. Um, and if you had a third person right. who was the jack of all trades, <laughs> you're made. <laughs> so I know that we're all jack of all trades, right? Like yeah, even right, 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 David right. has to learn new things because yeah. he needs to know how to do a certain thing to guide the team. Um, but also, you know, there's in the beginning, there was nobody covering certain parts of, you know, I don't know how you say it, but like, let's just say certain parts of like the code. So then he had to learn that part. Right. So yeah. we all become jack of all trades in the domain as, as, as much as we can, you know, as a sales driven founder, like I'm writing the website, right. Writing the sales pitches, doing <laughs> right, the pitch deck, right. right. Calling people, talking to customers. Like I'm not just going out there to sell, like I'm doing a lot yeah. of stuff. I'm, I'm doing the projections, right. Like I'm making sure there's money in the bank, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but, but the I jack think... of all trades. Yeah. It's just going to, really, yeah, so it's really important. Yeah. I'm just going to, the, the, I think the defining characteristic of a jack of all trades is someone who actually is interested in learning new things. Right. And yeah. it's like, let's figure this out because like, for example, with myself, um, I knew literally nothing about SEO. I had picked up a few things by sort of like being peripheral to it, but I was tasked. I remember you were like, basically like figure out SEO. That was sort of the directive I yeah. got, <laughs> you know, just like, yeah. not small. <laughs> and I felt completely overwhelmed at first, but then yeah. once I started getting under the skin of it, um, you know, then it became a challenge. It's like, how do we crack this nut and solve it and win? So it's like, you know, finding someone who's not afraid to learn, who enjoys learning, who enjoys solving problems. Um, yeah. Like then, cause inevitably no matter what, at a small startup with so few people, you're going to be doing a lot of different kinds of stuff. Yeah. And if it's the, and if your third Jack of all trades yeah. is someone like you, who is curious, who wants to succeed, who wants to support, you mm. know, the founders into creating a real business and understands yeah, right. where the gaps are, right? Like yeah. when I was describing the CTO and CEO, I didn't even begin to describe like, you know, the product, right? Like the CTO is not always a person that specs the product and, and all that yeah. stuff. Right? And, and in fact, he, he isn't, right? Yeah. Like you are. So if you have someone who is a jack of all trades, but is covering you in the operational side of things, yeah, right. you're, right, you're right. golden. However, if you don't have that person, you'll figure it out. Right. Because you're right. a startup, you have you'll to. figure it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's a huge bonus if marketing is on, you know, is an expertise that the team has. Right. But, you know, you figure it out like, yeah, you know, right. like we had to figure it out. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I feel like we've talked about a lot about finding the, the founding team, how to, you know, vet them, how to sort of the qualities you should look, you should look for. But what about um, what are your thoughts about trading work for equity? Like, let's talk about compensation a little bit. Yeah. I mean, 
my knee jerk reaction is don't do it. Hmm. Um, and I lived through kind of a nightmare scenario where in my previous company, of course, I didn't have any money, didn't have any experience. And I wanted more support for my CTO because um, yeah. our team was just so small. And we were just starting to build the, the new product. Um, my first company was an agency. And then my second company was a product company, but there was like a bridging period. Mm -hmm. And we needed to build a new product. And one of my friends at, uh, in Vancouver that owned a dev shop was like, oh, um, we can help you build the product with your co-founder uh, if you pay us half in cash and half in equity because, you know, we mm. want to do you a favor. That was how it was positioned to me, right? right? And I didn't really, you know, know what it was like to work with dev shops at that time or what it even meant to trade work for equity. But yeah. the equity would have been like 1.6% or something. So mm -hmm. it didn't feel like a lot. Um, and nothing feels like a lot in the beginning. And that's the problem, right? Yeah. Right. Um, and, you know, that relationship also didn't work out because actually what ended up happening was they ended up t like testing their junior hires on us. Oh, geez. So they were a dev shop that would work for like Adobe and Apple and all that stuff, but they right, would hire right, like these super right. junior people and test them on this free project because, you know, right. we were a throwaway right, and we only right. knew that, well, first the, the software was never working. Right. So I was like, well, how can this person have such a successful dev shop and be my friend, but the, nothing's ever working. And only, we only found out because somebody from inside the dev shop told us, Hey, by the way, this is happening. And so at that time, I was like so sick of this and, you know, felt cheated. Yeah. Um, and I was just like, you know what? Don't touch it anymore. We'll take it over. And I just signed off on it. I didn't, yeah. I didn't push back and I just signed off on it because it, it didn't seem like a lot, right? Right. However, um, where it did come back to bite me was I didn't realize that a shareholder of any percentage is still a shareholder. Mm -hmm. And so... When it came time to sell the company, like we're talking years later, yeah, um, I realized like because my my friend and I weren't in touch anymore. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the past few years, he sold that company to a public company without oh, telling geez. us. Oh my god! And so, at that point, who the the holder of those shares was the public company, oh, wow. but I didn't have a contact, and I actually got got in, got in touch with him and said, "Hey, can you give me a contact because I'm trying to contact their." lawyer and the CFO and no one's responding. And he was like, Oh, it's all up to you. I'm not in contact with them. Like he was just like super nonchalant about it. <laughs> and I was so pissed because I'm like, it matters so little to you. Right. This 1.6%. You could have just gave, given it back to me. Right. Right. Like I was the one that was suffering. You knew what, what, what place I was at, but you took advantage of me. Not only did you take advantage of me, you gave my shares away. Yeah. Like without even telling me. Yeah. So yeah. now I'm trying to scramble because every shareholder has to sign off on the closing documents. Otherwise you can't sell your company. Oh, so I only learned that by going through this process. And eventually the day before the previous company was, was closing, um, did I learn that you can't close a company without every signature, without taking them to court, even if you have majority. And this, this like might be a Canadian thing, or it might be how we structure the initial documents, but I even, I don't know how I did it, but somehow I found the mobile number of the CFO of that company and I texted him a sob story on how he needed, like, and how this was life-changing for me and he needed to sign it now. And he was very kind about it, but he cared so little that he didn't know I was trying to contact him this entire time. Oh, so what seems so little in the beginning, in the end, actually matters. Every percent matters. Right. So I think equity is really expensive. If you believe your company is going to be worth something someday, right? right? Nobody thinks about the 1% in the beginning, but you know, a shareholder is a shareholder. So imagine if you're just do the math, right? If your company is going to sell for 5 million, what's 1% of 5 million. And can you afford to pay that person less than that 1% right now? So right. my position now, and this is what I tell everybody is do whatever you can to pay people because you should be minimizing your cap table, not expanding it. Right. Right. And, and actually I run in the beginning, I ran into a lot of fairly senior, you know, consultants, contractors, agencies that were like, Oh, 
we only work with, you know, part cash, part equity. And I'm like, well, then I can't work with you. Like right. nobody has equity in the company unless they're buying into the equity. Right. And that's actually the only way that I can keep it fair. Right. So my default is like, do not trade work for equity because it's, it's what seems cheap now ends up being really expensive. Well, what's then, is there an appropriate use for equity? Like, what about using it for attracting talent? Like, how did you, what about equity for your co-founder? How do you decide on a split? Like, how did, what are your thoughts on that stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think with the founding team, it's always a bit tricky, right? Because you can't pay everybody market salary. And then, you know, people expect, you know, people expect equity to, you know. Yeah. You know, to, to work even part-time for you because they're taking so, you know, they're, they're halving the rate, like whatever that equation is. Right. Right. I think for right. a co-founder, you absolutely have to give them equity, but the way that I would suggest an equity split, um, is, well, first of all, like just because you're co-founders doesn't mean it's split down the middle. Like I'm not a believer of that because I don't believe that people are equal contributors. Yeah. Right. So I had the same conversation with David. Right. And, um, and luckily it wasn't a tough conversation because he saw me, I, I was with him for many years. So he saw my struggles with my previous co-founder yeah, and how, you know, having that equal split kind of wore down on me over time because I didn't feel like he was an equal con contributor. And I think that happens right. a lot, right. In like yeah, co-founder yeah. conflicts or whatnot. So yep. even with David, it was like, okay, you're coming in a year later. I'm going to do these things. You're going to do these things. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. based on the facts of what we both think we're going to contribute, what is the percentage that you need to feel ownership Yeah, and not feel like I'm trying to screw you over or, you know, like I don't want any of that. Right. So he thought about it, gave me a number. Um, I upped it a little bit and that was the, that was a split. And that's a fair split because it was, like everybody feels that that their opinion was heard, right? In, yeah, in that right. in that conversation. So I think between co-founders, like it's not like, well, I am a co-founder, so you cut it in half. It's like, well, no, let's have an honest conversation about what is required. Right. And what is required is not like, okay, product and sales. No, right. it's it's product, like coding, it's sales, it's marketing, accounting, recruiting, retention. Yeah. Right. The, these are just like some of the things, right? It's like, it's product management, right? It's uh, if you're an enterprise, then it's going to conferences, like, you know, whatever, whatever that might be. So there is like a, a fairly significant list of you when you start listing them out um, of, you know, the expertise that you need. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think for using equity to attract talent, I think um, I, because of the story I just told you, yeah, I am so careful of who right, has right. equity in this company. So either you buy in as a friends or family. So we had an early friends and family round, either you're buying in, everyone's on the same terms, but I pay people what they ask for. That's where I start. That is my starting point. So I'm not yeah. asking you to take concessions. Like I right. I'm, I'm using the money that I raise and my own money that I invest to pay yep. you your rate. Yep. But I tell everybody that comes in that if one day they stay with us long enough that they become an indispensable part of this, of, of this business, then there'll be, um, you know, options, right. Opportunities yep. for options, yep. but you can't come to me and say, well, I'm not going to join this team unless you give me options. Well, I don't know who you right. are. <laughs> right? I don't even know if you're going to stay. And then all of a sudden I'm chasing you around to sign my closing papers. Yeah. Right? Like that's kind of how I think about it. And that's why like, I tell everybody like pay people when you can. Um, but I, I also recognize that that's kind of a luxury and you can't always. Yeah. And but I just guess be maybe... very careful. Right. Cause like equity is like toothpaste. You got to think about it like toothpaste. Once it's out of the tube, <laughs> it's... there is no way to stuff it back in. So be very <laughs> careful, like who you're tying yourself to. Yeah. And I guess it's like, this is more of a thing that VC backed companies can do. Cause they can, you know, they can use equity um, to attract people and stuff, but it is very different story for a bootstrapped startup, I think. Um, well, a lot of times when people say equity, they actually mean options, right? Because right. equity has value. Um, yeah, right. And actually, right, I had to right. do this thing with David where, like, because he was coming in a year later and there was already, in theory, IP that was created before him, 
Mm -hmm. Um, I couldn't give him equity without Mm. a tax implication on either side. Mm. So if I gave him equity, um, and the IRS challenges him, then, and he didn't pay tax on that because it, it would have been kind of like income, then he would have been in trouble. Right. So, um, the way that we did it financially was, um, I was, I sold it to him. Right. So in theory, right. I sold it to him and I basically just reported on the gains that I didn't actually receive. So I paid right. taxes on the equity that I gave him because it was a year in. And that's why people do options because options are not real, right? It's just a right, right. option to convert to shares later on. Right, right. Um, so then equity aside, how do you, how do you budget for a founding team? How do you, how did you, pay for it because you got to pay people, right? So yeah, <laughs> yeah that's tough. Well, first you got to sell a startup. <laughs> and then, yeah. Um, yeah, and then that you did help. Them. Yeah, that did help a little bit. But I, I mean, jokes aside, I didn't sell it for like, you know, yeah. retirement level, like tech crunch, yeah. like worthy money, right? Like enough right, to keep right. myself alive. For, I, I knew enough to keep myself alive for a few years. Um, and then enough to write the first check um, in, into the company to show that I was sincere about you know, what we're doing. Um, and, and the thing is, I believe like if, if you can't invest your own money, nobody else will like, right. So I'm going to be the first person to, you know, put my money where, or put my money where my, where my mouth is. Um, but you know, both you and David had contracting jobs that were paying pretty well. Um, and that lasted, you know, a good two years before, you know, that, that ended. Um, But the way that I budgeted was like, I just tried to keep burn, you know, as low as possible. I raised just enough for, you know, two years of runway, like from friends and family. I'm pretty obsessive with like my Excel projection. So I knew exactly how much I could spend on who. Um, And, you know, in Vietnam, I mean, we, we upped our, you know, we upped the rate now, but like, you know, a senior in Vietnam, we were paying 4,000 a month for. And like senior in Vietnam is not senior in New York. Right. Right. But it's, it's very different. However, like they're, they're pretty good. They're not awesome, but they're pretty good. Yeah. So we were keeping burn as low as possible, um, based on, you know, where we were hiring. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, and I did it very differently before. Like I, I had talked about this before, like, you know, I, in my past startup, you know, I just had an agency and I just took money for services. And then I took all the revenue with that and got a loan against that and then put all that money into a new company. And that was like my starting capital. Um, I think as a bootstrapper, you just, you just make it work. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you take side hustles, you take side jobs, you find people with side hustles, you find people where it's like cheap to hire. And you literally just make it work. Yeah, right. And I don't know how this happens, but the people that have made it have just done it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. And so, like, can you kind of summarize, like, as a bootstrapped company without product or revenue, right? You have no product, no revenue. How do you attract, how do you get people to come on board at the very beginning? I mean, we've talked kind of talked about this the whole time, but how would you kind of wrap, wrap that up? Yeah. I mean, I think you, you need to have like something to offer that's not equity, right? Mm. Like, like I've heard a lot of times, um, you know, cause I'm also in a lot of founder groups and Facebook groups and things like that. Somebody will be like, I need a co-founder. I will give you 30%. It's like, well, yeah, 30% of zero is still zero. Yeah. Like no one's going to quit their job for equity. That's worth nothing, especially when you have nothing. Right. Yeah. So I think while equity is like, should not be taken lightly, from a shareholder's perspective, it's not worth anything to someone right. that can actually help you. Yeah, Anyone senior sure. who can help you accelerate will know that 90% of startups don't work out. So you right. just need to pay me, right? So yeah. um, I think especially in the beginning, the thing that you have to offer is you have to let people believe that you are the one that's going to take them to this promised land, right? So whether it's you wanting more freedom and you don't have that today, right? Like you have to make them believe that you will take them closer to their ultimate goal. 
right? So, and you need to, and through that, you make them believe that investing in you is going to be better than investing in their own job right now, or, you know, another, another founder, right? And that's, and that's hard to do. Um, but the way that I did it, and I think I did the same thing with you is like, I just explained the premise of this lifestyle company where mm -hmm. I want to get to just in life as a person, yep. like living freely, traveling, having fun and wanting to provide that for the rest of my team. Um, and ideally I have a group that, that I get along with and that I'm friends with. Um, but you need people not with just aligned vision for what you're building. Yeah. Right. You need their aligned vision on how you can help them live. Cause I think that's more and more important as like people are putting lifestyle ahead of work and happiness, you know, ahead of revenue is like, how is working for you going to make them better? Not just richer. Yeah. Right. But like just better, happier. Um, and I think being authentic, you know, into sharing yeah. that vision is, is probably the best way. Um, but that's how you get people on board is like, you make them think that by working with you, you're, they're going to get something that they can't get from the company right. that they're working with right. now. And that's how you get them to work with you on their free time. Like instead yeah. of going out on Sunday, like they're going to work on this. Yeah. And I, I agree with you that that only really works if you do it authentically, right? If you're trying to like pull something over on someone or try to convince them when there's kind of no there there, like, like that doesn't work. Cause, but um, yeah, authenticity I think is key. So I, I, I think we're kind of getting ready to wrap up. Do you have any kind of final suggestions for, um, for people who are listening um, about what they should do to put a team together from the start, especially if they don't have a co-founder or a candidate for a co-founder? Co what would your, what would your fi kind of final suggestions be? Yeah. I mean, I would say like, don't jump into anything quickly. Like don't feel like you have to jump into anything quickly. Yeah. Like, don't feel like just because you have a startup, you need to find a co-founder today. Like work with people as contractors, pay them, like work a side job so you can pay them yeah. and figure out what that relationship is going to be like before you start splitting your house. Like that is like my number one suggestion is like, you don't need to split anything. Like just, just date a bit first before you get married. Um, and if you don't know who that person is yet, like go and network, right? Go to the meetups, go to the startup events, ask your yeah. friends. Like I joined on deck, right? Um, it's like yeah. this cohort, like co learning community, um, based on San Francisco, but now they're everywhere. But like within those communities, there are, thousands of people looking for co-founders yeah and right. but even when you find that person don't be like great like todd you can be my co-founder let's incorporate and we could just split it in half like just chill out a bit <laughs> and yeah. um right right just see if the other person if you're the person with the idea just see if the person even likes the idea yeah and i guarantee you if you work with them for two to three months you will know if they have passion for it or not because they yeah. cannot fake liking something for that long. Yeah, right. Well, okay. That well, I think that's a great place to wrap up. Um, uh, so, just to kind of summarize what we talked about today, talked about putting together a founding team. That's been the sort of whole theme of today. Working with contractors, how to find and choose the right people, and then finally, we talked about what it takes to convince um, convince those people to come on board. So you know, what's your hot take with all that in mind? Do you have a hot take for us at the end of, of the episode? Yeah, I think, um, I think my hot take is as a bootstrap company, the best thing you can do is to work with contractors because it makes it financially feasible for you to have a company at all. Um, and don't limit that to, you know, the rest of the team, like also see your co-founder as someone that you can test out, like same thing, right? Like you don't have to jump into something so quickly, but like just start light and then yeah. expand outwards is like, like you don't have to copy your venture, venture back friends, right? What they're going to do is get an office. They get, you know, they get money, they get an office, they hire everybody on day one, like as an employee, <laughs> like you, 
you don't have that luxury and yeah. don't feel like that's one way of building a business, but it's not the only way. And it's certainly not the cheapest way, like the absolute cheapest and most efficient way to start a business is to hire people as needed in a place where you can afford them. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. What is, uh, what is your hot take? I mean, it's sort of like a, a kind of different take on the same idea, which is, is don't settle. And what I mean by that is, is, um, uh, I mean, I can see how it happens at the beginning. There's enthusiasm. You share your idea, you vibe with someone, let's dive in, let's just do it. Here's half. Right. Um, but by starting light and taking it slow, you can also realize that um, something isn't working and to not be afraid to say this didn't work because when a team's this small, everyone has to be great. Like everyone yeah. has to be great. So you can't end up with a dud. It's way too painful in the, in the long term. So like w maybe don't settle isn't quite right. It's more like take your time. It's sort of what you were saying, but, but yeah. that's the, that's the idea. Just don't, you can't afford to have anyone uh, on your founding team who's not great. But that w works also on the other side, right? If you're looking to join a founding team of something else, right? Yeah, like, for sure. Don't feel like you need to commit 100%. Like, if you're a CTO of a Absolutely. big company now and you've always wanted to join a startup, like, ask a startup that you're interested in if you can just contract for them as a fractional CTO, even if you can't code all the time. Like, like take part early, like get in early as a ground floor startup. And if it doesn't work, you're not committed. But yeah. I think it's a great way to like vet other startups. Um, and in fact, like that, when, when David was a fractional CTO, that was one of his ideas was like, oh, if I just kind of dabbled into multiples and I have many eggs and many baskets and maybe I'll come up with, or maybe I'll meet a startup where I actually want to join, but yeah, we're actually going to talk about that on our next episode. So I'm going to okay. stop here right. and wrap it up here. <laughs> um, so if there are particular topics that you want us to get into this season, uh, please let me know by connecting with me on LinkedIn. Uh, if you have any feedback about this podcast, I'd love to hear from you. My name is Melissa Kwan, last name spelled K-W-A-N. And if what we've talked about today resonates with you, subscribe to Profit Lead on your favorite podcast app to get notified of new episodes and join our mailing list by going to ProfitLed.fm. I promise to only share things you'll actually care about. Thanks so much for listening to this episode.